And then more recently, in this era, we have one other person whose picture I didn't show you, but I will now, Dr. Bruce Ames, who was a Linus Pauling student, who became the head of biochemistry at the University of California, Berkeley, and is now 80 some years young and carrying the flame, still doing active research and publishing, has a whole research group at Oakland Children's Hospital, Professor Emeritus from Berkeley. And he wrote the seminal article that really codifies all of this work over the last 70 years that appeared in the American Journal of Clinical Attrition. This is an article that all of us in the field wish we would have written, but uh, he was the person to write it. Uh, this has 650 some references in it, going back and asking the question, what is the public world, what is the published the world's literature that supports from good science the role of increased value from vitamin intake beyond that of the RDA? Looking at it from a biochemical perspective, this orthomolecular perspective. And he goes on to say, as many as one third of mutations in a gene result in the corresponding enzyme having an increased Michaelis constant. That's the way biochemists kind of assess the, the uh, binding efficiency of a coenzyme to an enzyme, so this Michaelis constant. And so you say, can you vary the Michaelis constant, the binding of a vitamin to its co co coenzyme uh, through the genes? And the answer is yes. And so to get, you either change the genes or you, you just give more of the message until it finally sticks. Uh, the analogy I use is a, is a as a boy when I was a baseball player, was a catcher. And the thing about being a catcher was you wanted your glove to be perfect, have a perfect pocket, right? So when that ball got anywhere near the pocket, it would stick. You didn't want the ball bouncing out, right? So as, as a young boy, I can remember putting linseed oil in my catcher's mitt, putting my baseball, my hard ball in there, and slipping on it, right? Because that's the way you really make the pocket strong. So that's like orthomolecular medicine. How do you get the pocket to bind to the baseball. You just keep hitting the baseball into the pocket harder and harder. How do you increase the rate of hitting? By increasing the concentration. Take more of it. That's the concept, right? So the need for an individual is based on their genetic uniqueness. It's not based upon a standard on the back of cereal boxes. Am I making sense here or am I, am I losing it? So lastly, let me just uh, tell you how this all really works. I believe. So we have these well-defined genetic illnesses that everybody knows is just the bad luck of the draw of the genes. One of those, which is so common in life births in the United States that we have in our neonatal units a test for it in the diapers, is called phenylketonuria, right? So if a phenylketonuric child who cannot metabolize the amino acid phenylalanine has this condition in their first urine that will go into their diaper, will be the unmetabolized phenylalanine. And there is a dye in the diaper that will pick that up and make a blue color. So it's a diagnosis of that condition. So why? Because if you keep that child then on a phenylalanine rich diet, a normal diet, they will develop retardation and early death. So the treatment for this condition is to remove phenylalanine from their diet to the extent possible, which generally means a medically prescribed diet using a medical food. It's but no phenylalanine. Are you following so far? I'm limited amount of phenylalanine. Okay, and it's very difficult for the parents, obviously, and the child's a pretty, use the word bland, pretty bland diet. So if you could find a better way to do that, an easier way, be nice. So now let's use orthomolecular medicine. So the concept is phenylalanine can't be converted into its downstream product, which is called tyrosine. The enzyme that does that in the body is called phenylalanine hydroxylase. Am I okay so far? Now does that enzyme work all by itself? No, it has a coenzyme that facilitates its activity. And what is the coenzyme for phenylalanine hydroxylase? Tetrahydrobiopterin, one of the folic acid derived related materials. Tetrahydrobiopterin. So now you might ask the question, if what I've told you is at all correct about orthomolecular medicine, meaning increase the concentration to drive a sluggish equilibrium to completion to get normal function based on that person's genes, could you then give higher doses of tetrahydrobiopterin and treat phenylketonuria? And what is this particular summary? In the New England Journal of Medicine, I want to emphasize, I've not gone to a tertiary third grade journal talking about the standard of identity in good medicine. In this paper, they show tetrahydrobiopterin supplementation led to responsiveness 
in patients with mild to moderate PKU, reducing the need to restrict melalonin in the gut, normalizing their physiology. Why? Because it does this. It promotes the conversion of phenylalanine to tyrosine by activating the enzyme that's not defective, it's unique. Right? I want to emphasize, once you start to talk about defective enzymes, you start talking about flaws, well, I'm telling you, every one of us has flaws, if we're going to use that as a definition. I would like to say every one of us has uniqueness. Because in the right place, what one might call a flaw is really a strength. I like to use that relative to my obnoxious personality. In the right place, my obnoxious personality is really an asset. I just have to know when to use it. So, so that, that's really the, the kind of construct of this whole model. So then Dr. Ames follows up on this and says, well, what does this really mean? It means something about the difference of adequate health and optimal health. That's the really key kind of driver here. If all we're trying to do is prevent scurvy, very, very, zero pralmia, rickets, squash, or marasmus, we don't need a whole lot of these nutrients. But if we're trying to drive to optimal function, compress morbidity, extend functional health, then we're going to ask a different series of questions, and we're going to be more personalized in our treatment of that patient. And we're not going to use 70 kilogram human beings in the back of cereal boxes as our guide. We're going to use that patient and their history as the guide. And that means their individual health history, their family history. So he goes on to say, many common micronutrient insufficiencies based upon specific genetic constituents cause mitochondrial decay with oxidant leakage leading to accelerated aging and neural decay. Many things like Alzheimer's disease. It's not just age alone. In fact, I'll close with the following statement. I have looked at the literature extensively. I've talked to gerontologists. I've been on a search for years and years to ask, is there ever been a study published in animals or humans that demonstrates that any disease is caused by aging? Now, let me make sure I understand what I'm saying. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying it's associated with aging. We know that's obviously true. I'm saying it's caused. The mechanism of causation of that disease is a consequence directly of something related to aging. And the answer is no, it's still equivocal. There has never been a demonstrable proof in animals or humans that a disease, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, is caused singularly by aging. So there's a lot of variable in the equation. And it's that variable that constitutes the new medicine. It is really what Archibald Garad was talking about. It's really what happened when Jean Cartier and his sailors got locked into the ice in the St. Lawrence Seaway. It's really what the First Nation natives knew when they told them to make that bark tea. It's really what Lynn proved in his clinical trials, small as it was. It's really what Cook introduced into his seaboard explorations and never lost a person to scurvy and became world famous. It's really why the British beat back the French and Spanish Armada and that we don't speak all the languages we probably should speak. On and on and on this model. How much you have to radiate the light to create a social change. That's going to be your job. That's what you're training yourself for. What an opportunity to leverage this information and create that change. Thanks very much. So the first and simplest and low technology way to get to the answer, which is the way that's trying to prove is good clinical observation judgment and a nutritional assessment, right? which is what I'm sure you are learning through your curriculum. How do you visualize a patient in their presentation with the eyelids and the chylosis and the dermatitis and the you know, all the various things that you go through, the luster of their hair, the color of their eyes, the uh, easy bruising, all these myriad of things that, that track back to a pattern that suggests certain kinds of nutritional needs. 